Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the demonstration. We're going to be talking about uh, creative uses of Analog Effects Pro 2. Uh, my name is Dan Hughes, and I'm going to be walking you through this demonstration. First of all, um, I'm going to be launching Analog Effects from Photoshop today, although you could be launching the software from uh, Lightroom or from Photo Labs 2. There's some great advantages um, of using each one of those different host pieces of software. Um, in Photoshop here, we do have the ability to work with layers and layer masks and blending modes and so on and so forth. Um, Lightroom is easy if you're a Lightroom user and you don't want to open images into Photoshop. And then Photolab is fantastic uh, because it kind of houses everything in a really wonderful, beautiful, simple raw processing tool and then allows you to use Analog Effects Pro in the entire Nick suite um, directly from Photolab 2's interface. We're using Photoshop here because it's easy for me to navigate through uh, the demo and also because one of my images uh, I want to talk a little bit about using layers, layer masks, and so on. So uh, first of all, um, I tend to use Analog Effects Pro on a few different kinds of photographs. Uh, this image is a kind of stylized panoramic photograph that I shot with a really wide angle lens and um, I, I wanted to have a little bit of this foreground down here. And this has created this distortion because of the way that I've handheld and shot this panoramic. And then the other thing that's happening is because I've handheld shooting this panoramic, um, my exposures weren't perfect in terms of sharpness. Um, you can start to see that here with the foreground of these two gentlemen and then um, the background being sharp. And I think in one of the exposures, I even had a little bit of a of camera shake because my exposure, my shutter speed was a little bit too slow and I moved the camera in, in the exposure. Now, the beauty of analog is that we're going to be utilizing some of these, uh, some of these maladies or problems that you can run into in photography as stylistic aesthetic choices. So oftentimes I find myself when I make mistakes and I want to use the photograph for something, I'll use Analog Effect Pro to kind of massage the image in one direction or another uh, to get a pretty stylized image, at least in this case, um, and then also to, if you will, save nice frames that have maybe technical problems. Now I'm gonna open up Analog Effects Pro here from the Nick Selective tool. So let's get started. Uh, I wanna to talk to you about the interface in Analog Effects Pro before we get into uh, some of the different uses that, that I find myself using Analog Effects Pro for. And um, first of all, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, Analog Effects Pro, the idea is the software is designed to help to stylize images in ways that photography companies, whether it be film companies or optical um, lens makers and camera manufacturers, have been trying to actually get rid of for the past 200 years in photography. We, we actually uh, took those problems and allowed you as the photographer to kind of control the image. Because one of the problems with something like dirt and scratches or lens vignettes is that if, if you work with them in camera, it can be very difficult to control that in an aesthetically pleasing way. Um, maybe not so much lens vignette because you kind of know what's gonna happen depending upon what f-stop you shoot at with a particular lens, but we can actually introduce dirt and scratches onto an image, make it aesthetically pleasing, a layer of texture or something like that, uh, and it works really nicely. Now, Analog Effects Pro is broken up into um, different classic, or sorry, different cameras. Now, the classic camera, if you follow me into the upper left corner, actually utilizes a certain set of kind of filters. So I've clicked on classic camera one. This is a preset, basically. And if you follow me to the right side of the interface, we've got basic adjustments, dirt and scratches, lens vignette, film type, um, and all of these different cameras, sorry, all of these different kind of presets or set within the classic camera settings are going to be utilizing that filter set. If you click into the classic camera on this little arrow in the upper left corner, you can access uh, 11 different 
tool combinations. So these, basically it's 10 different cameras and then a set of tools called En Vogue, which was just recently built into the, the very most recent version of the Nick collection by DxO. Um, and each one of these tool combinations will yield you a completely different effect. So if I click on color cast, and then we click onto one of the presets here. Watch what happens to the tools palette on the right side. We'll go from that filter stack, if you will, over here to a different filter stack where this uh, color uh, cast number three preset is going to be using basic adjustments, light leaks, film types. So we're going to talk about how to create our own um, sort of filter stack on the left side. But the first thing that I do want to do is use one of these tool combinations. Uh, I am drawn towards the En Vogue. This is actually a collection of kind of presets or tool combinations that I created uh, back in December and uh, have been integrated into Analog Effects Pro. So I'm super excited to have these built into the software for a couple reasons. First of all, it's just kind of awesome to have my work integrated into the software. And then also, these are filter combinations that I'm using really often. So uh, you might find them to be really wonderful or maybe not. And what you can do is actually create your own. So uh, let's talk about how to do that. I'm gonna click on Auto Chrome. This is the second preset in En Vogue. Let's kind of massage this set of filters and adjustments, and then let's save our own preset really quickly um, so that we can get a good idea how to do that. And then also, I, I find myself saving my own kind of custom presets and then using them over and over again. In fact, I have two images that are relatively similar of these kind of grandiose architectural photos with um, a kind of, actually both of them have water in the foreground, a little reflection pool. Um, and I want to have the exact same set of adjustments for the most part, so I have a consistent look and feel across the board. Um, so, in the basic adjustments section here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just check this off, turn it off. I'm going to turn off each of these different tools, and I'm going to do that in this case so that I can kind of walk you through what each one is doing. So, as I turn off each of those checkboxes to the left of the label of the filter, um, that's going to basically disable that filter and then I can turn each one on and I can see exactly what that tool is doing. So in this case on the basic adjustments uh, we've got a detail extraction slider that's really pumped up really bringing out a lot of texture. I'm going to dial that back a little bit to make this a little bit more subtle because I love what the autochrome uh, preset was doing but I want it to be a little softer feel, not not super harsh, especially because this image already had a good amount of texture in the foreground and in the clouds themselves. Uh, I'm going to brighten the image back up a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to double click on the contrast slider. That's going to go ahead and um, reset the contrast tool. And then uh, one last thing while we're in basic adjustments, some of these filters have control points and some of them don't. So uh, the basic adjustments tool has control points and basically allows us to control these different attributes. So I place my control point on the object that I want to control, um, in this case in the reflection here, and it has detail extraction, brightness, contrast, and saturation. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and brighten up that reflection just a little bit, just kind of opening up those shadows a touch. I'm going to reduce the contrast a little bit as well. And then let's see what happens if we increase saturation. That's kind of nice. Bringing that up just a little bit uh, draws the attention towards that reflection a little bit more. Um, if we didn't want that control point in there, you could just click on the point. It's already active, meaning I can see and control the different sliders. We could just hit the delete key on our keyboard to get rid of it. Now I actually wanted that control point, so I'm going to hit Command Z on my keyboard. That's going to walk us back one step, and it's going to redo adding that control point for us. So that's back in there. Um, from basic adjustments, let's turn on Bokeh, or Bokeh, depending upon how you pronounce it. And uh, this filter is basically going to add a blur effect to the image. Um, we also are introducing these on-image controls. So um, I'm going to increase the blur strength. And then basically, we're going to just take a look at how this on image control works, right? In the middle of the on image control, we have none of that blur occurring. And then uh, outside of this first initial circle, um, 
we, we have a sort of transition or a gradient of the blur occurring, where closest to that inner circle, there is only a little bit of blur, and the further out we go, we're going to have the full um, amount of whatever our blur strength and our settings are over here on the right. So um, I'm not going to leave blur strength at 100%, but just so that we can kind of get a good idea of what's happening as we slide these around, um, the, the blur strength is relatively obvious as to what that's doing. It's, it's the overall strength, or the amount of blur that we're adding in with the filter. Uh, the boost highlights allows us to control the brightness of the highlights. It's trying to emulate what might happen if you actually somehow could create this blurring effect optically. And then the other thing that we have here is an aperture control. So you can change kind of the feel of the aperture. If we actually had specular highlights in this image, you'd get a really good idea um, of, of, you'd actually get a representation of the um, shape of the aperture. In fact, you're starting to see that in a few of these places here. So um, on the image, if you watch as I change through these different shapes, right here, right here, uh, a little bit down here, and then you can start to see that shape right here as well. If I toggle through those, you can actually see the change in that shape. Pretty neat tool, to be honest. It's it's really powerful as well, and kind of emulates what might happen if you could either create your own apertures, or if you, um, you had a five, um, five lens or sorry five blade aperture or a six blade or so on and so forth um, and then you can uh, vary the shape and then you can rotate the aperture as well basically it's just a, a separate control of exactly what the blur is doing i like what's happening here because we're blurring out the the people that were over here on the left but i think it's too strong so let's kind of control the on image control so i'm going to click on some of these um uh, controls and just drag them out so that we can kind of affect the shape and we can affect the rotation of the blur and um, I I want to decrease the amount of blur that's happening here probably quite a bit on this image because I just want the edges to have a little bit of blur and that's going to draw the viewers attention towards the center of the image uh, even with just a little subtle blur going on uh, we should get a nice effect. So basically my corners are blurred and um, we have this nice gradient towards the middle. See, this is what I'm saying. The, you know, optically the, these Tamron, Sigma, Canon, Nikon, Zeiss, all of these companies have spent thousands, millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, to try to get rid of, um, you know, these, these vignettes and these uh, blurred edges. And here we're able to kind of add that back in and control it. So my take on that is to, in camera, while I'm capturing, control kind of the cleanest, best image I possibly can, um, and then affect the image however I see fit when I bring it into something like Analog Effects Pro. So moving into light leaks, and I'm not going to explain every one of these filters because I think it just takes some experimentation, um, but all of these filters are going to give you this really wonderful kind of control over the um, whatever the thing is. So I'm adding a light leak into this image. The sun is kind of up here. So I like this light leak because it's kind of creating this blurred effect on the corners in the lower left and in the upper right. And then we can actually control where that light leak is, is, is being applied. So, you know, this is almost the complete opposite of if you were out shooting film and you were getting light leaks because your camera didn't seal properly or something like that. Um, this gives us the ability to actually control the effect, the amount, where it's affecting, and the kind of um, light leaks that you might want to put on there. So this is interesting because we get this really powerful kind of control over the image and this really beautiful variation depending upon what the goal of the image is. Um, so we've got a little bit of a lens vignette on the image. I'm going to actually decrease that, uh, make it a little bit more subtle. Again, my intention is to kind of draw your eye in towards our subject here. We're doing that with the composition, with the reflecting pool, and then we're also doing that um, by adding in these, these tools in the filter. Uh, film types. Film types are a really neat tool. Um, I'm going to leave this on the warm setting, but you've got five different uh, film type controls, two of which are black and white, three of which are color. Um, I tend to use the subtle effect more than cool and warm, uh, but in this case, I, I enjoy the effect of the warm on this image, and then I just 
I'm going to fade out the shadows a little bit more. And basically what this slider does is you can either retain the, the deep dark shadow detail by keeping the film type neutral to faded slider over towards neutral, or I can kind of fade those shadows and kind of um, mute them a little bit, reducing contrast basically. And sp specifically in the shadows, in the very darkest tones. And then you can uh, add grain. You can have as much or as little grain as you might want, because here we're emulating a film type. I'm going to have, uh, actually, I'm going to reduce all of the grain by setting the grain per pixel over at 500. It just makes it so none of the grain is really visible. And then I'm going to turn my frames on. And I actually really like this frame on this photograph, um, but the frames tool is full of a bunch of different frames. Um, film strip, let's click on that. This is going to emulate uh, the, the edge effects of a a roll of film or different kinds of film, um, one uh, or several of which are actually emulations of like a Type 55 or a Polaroid film edge um, somehow in color. And then you can change the scale. So you can encroach further into the image or less, not so far into the photo, depending upon what your intention is. Uh, I'm going to go back to the white and I'm going to click into, how about the round edge one instead of the original that we had? And we're just going to increase the scale so we've got a little bit of this effect. So um, once I get what I want out of this frame, I'm just going to save this as a custom preset. Uh, actually, let's take a quick look at the before and after. I might take a uh, control point in the basic adjustments and actually add or increase the brightness in the building itself. So dodge that a little bit. I'm holding the compare button. You're seeing the original image. Here's the enhanced image. I like this muted effect on this photograph. It kind of makes the image feel a little bit more eerie. Uh, and I think it matches the aesthetic of the evening as well. So I'm going to place a control point on the building. I'm going to just bring the brightness up of the building just a touch. Again, with the goal of kind of attracting your attention a little more towards the building. Uh, maybe increase saturation and a little structure, or sorry, contrast in this case. Um, one last compare with the before and after. There's the original. There's the enhanced. I like what we're getting. Let's save this as a, say, or a custom preset. So if you follow my cursor down to the right side of our filter stack, I'm going to click the Save button, and I'm just going to name this, um, how about State Capital? The name doesn't really matter in this case. I'm probably actually going to end up deleting this because this is pretty similar to the Autochrome preset that's built in. But I'm going to click the OK button here. That's going to save into my custom settings. So um, where we were before, we were within the camera section on the left side. If you scroll down, we have uh, custom recipes, presets rather. Um, and now this one is going to be down a little bit. Uh, actually, it should be in alphabetical order or possibly down at the very bottom. Oh, state capital. I see. I thought I named it capital. Here it's state capital. So it's right there. And uh, all of these are just custom presets that I've created. Now, one last thing or a few things to mention about the uh, interface here while we're in the software right now. Um, there's an imported section. So if you were to like download presets and then import them into your software, uh, they are going to show up in the imported section. The way that you would import a recipe or a preset is to click the plus button. That's to the right of the imported label there in the uh, left side of the interface. There's a history state browser. So this actually records every single thing we've done to our image since we've opened it into Analog Effects Pro. And then there's instant help as well. And the instant help basically allows you, as you scroll over something, it gives you an indication as to what your where, where your cursor is and what you're in. So this is a nice way to kind of learn the interface as well. Okay, I love our effect. I'm happy. We're going to go ahead and click the OK button in the lower right corner because I spent a good amount of time talking about this first image. So we go back over into Photoshop. And what's happening in Photoshop is that uh, our original background is still there. And then our uh, filters have been applied to a duplicated set of pixels. So our original image is there and we can always get back to it if we wanted to or needed to. Now, I have a very similar image, and I don't even know how, I meant, how I've done this. Uh, the way that I've shot both of these images were the same. I guess I'm drawn to uh, this sort of aesthetic. And also, a lot of buildings, these grandiose buildings, seem to have reflecting pools. Um, and so I've just you know, lined this up in a somewhat symmetrical way. This is also a handheld composite um, image. I've just reduced the pixel dimension so that it's much smaller. Um, so if you're wondering or 
if you're curious about how this image was made, basically I've just shot, I think this was with a um, 85 millimeter lens. I shot a frame, moved the camera, shot a frame, moved the camera, shot a frame, and tried to keep the, the sensor basically in the exact same spot uh, if possible. And actually this is a more successful um, representation of this this panoramic technique and it, it's much easier to shoot this way with a longer lens uh, than what I tried to do with this wide angle lens I'm going to get this really weird distortion and you can probably see that in the curvature of the building we could fix that I, be, I didn't purposefully um, for aesthetic purposes I just thought it, it worked um, now Getting into workflow here in Photoshop, this image has been processed using Color Effects Pro. I find myself using multiple NIC plugins most times. Um, sometimes I'll use maybe just Viveza or just Analog or only Silver Effects Pro. But um, if it's a photograph that I'm going to do something with, I'm going to maybe end up printing it or it's going to uh, be published somewhere. I, I do tend to use numerous uh, plugins from the Nick collection on a single image. So this is probably a little bit closer to what my actual workflow is. I've got another image that I'll show you later. So let's open up Analog Effects Pro. Um, this is practically the same picture. Let's see what happens when we go into those custom presets that I've uh, that we just created and just use that same preset that we created for the previous image. So state capital. And the thing is, is if it's not perfect, we just have to go in and hone the adjustments, right? So um, the the vignette is a little bit strong on this image now, and uh, what else? So let's go right into the vignette because I know that I want to reduce that. I want less of it because I kind of like the flare that's occurring. Oops, I'm going to bring that actually to zero. And then maybe go into the film type and let's mute this. Uh, or faded a little bit less. So we've got a nice sort of dark shadow tone. There we go. And then we'll just go into the light leaks and we're going to move the on image control to position the light leak in a slightly different way. Let's see what would happen if we just have the light leak on the left. And so in this case, if I want my images to kind of look the same, um, I'm going to kind of use the same light leaks and probably even the same... Um, Dirt, dirt and scratches and so on if I wanted two images to kind of hang on the wall next to each other aesthetically um, it, it would just match a little bit better if I'm going to have this really strong overall um, massage or or change in the pixels right as, especially if I'm going to be presenting these images kind of together or in a series or something like that I kind of um, and, and of course I'm generalizing when I'm saying this but I think aesthetically that these images will actually go really nicely next to each other. So I'm happy with our effect. We've used a preset. We've um, gone and massaged the image. And uh, let's just take a look at what these photos look like next to each other um, in Photoshop. So I'll drag this image out. Uh, and we have a pretty similar effect. If we minimize this, shrink this down, I've lost my other image. There we go. So they have a pretty similar effect, and I think that those would probably end up looking nice in a, in a series together. Simple images, they're kind of consistent. It was not meaningful either. I, didn't, I just seemed to be drawn to shooting those panoramics that way. But anyways, moving on, moving forward, keeping uh, this going quickly. Uh, this is kind of maybe more convoluted than a normal workflow of mine would look like. But if we look at the layers palette here on this image, this is a really nice, simple photo. This is a, a photograph by Ronald Rot Watzlau. Wow, Ronald Watzlau, uh, who is a, a raw engineer, literally works on raw files um, for in photography. He's a great photographer as well and has loaned me this image for this um, demonstration. And uh, this is sort of a classic use of this uh, combination of filters. So this is the original image. It, it has... Like it, it, it draws me in. It's a simple photograph. It looks like it's on the side of a trail that uh, Ronald was out walking on. And what we're going to do is just transform it into something a lot more dramatic using a combination of tools. So this is Color Effects Pro, um, Silver Effects Pro using a particular workflow. So this is uh, Silver Effects Pro using the, the blue color filter to kind of darken down everything. And the idea here is when I made these adjustments, I'm paying attention to the background, 
knowing that I'm going to select out uh, the fern here and I'm going to end up creating this really bright representation uh, of the same image. So here's what we've done. Dark representation, paying attention to the background, and then I used Analog Effects Pro to blur the whole image and kind of mute the whole photograph while still retaining nice textures. Um, and then I actually turned all of those black and white layers off, went back into Silver Effects Pro. This time I'm paying attention to the fern itself and I used um, something like a yellow filter and then some other massaging with uh, structure and some control points. And then all I did was in Photoshop masked that stuff out. So this image, all it's doing is it's, sorry, this layer of the image, all it's doing is it's converting this portion to black and white. And then you can see I've got a little bit of it um, on this fern back here. So then when I turn on my um, black and white layers underneath, now I have this really interesting separation. So this is something that, that something like Ansel Adams or John Sexton might be doing in the darkroom, um, although they would be shooting film and processing it in a certain way that works for whatever capture they've made. And then they're going to be doing this in the, in the wet darkroom. We're doing this in the digital darkroom, but with a similar mindset, similar idea and thought process. And then I actually added another layer of Analog Effects Pro where I've used one of the edges, the frames from Analog Effects Pro to kind of finish this image off. So I, I don't even need to open up Analog in that case to show you that. I just wanted to talk you through that kind of workflow. So on this image, uh, this is a, a photo that was shot in the spring in northeastern New York, actually in a park called All Sable Point. And um, it was just a flooded road, seemed interesting. And what I want to do is kind of uh, distort this a little bit more. I think it's going to drive it home. So we're going to use one layer of Analog Effects Pro. This is the original capture. Oop, no, that's not, this is the original capture. And then uh, here is the effect that we're going to create using Analog. So um, in this case, using Analog Effects Pro, we're going to create our own stack of filters. So, so far what we've done is we've used some of the cameras and the presets that are on the left side, but you can actually create your own set of filters yourself. So to do that, uh, you move into the upper left corner, click into the cameras, and then you just click on camera kit. And I think that this is probably uh, my favorite way of working, but the camera kit can be kind of time consuming because you have to play. You have to figure out what's going to work best with um, with this image. I do know I want to use the uh, basic adjustments, and I do know I want to use uh, lens distortion as well. And the lens distortion tool is going to allow us to kind of create a barrel or a pincushion distortion. And I, I like that effect in this case with this water reflecting the trees. We're going to really kind of mess with reality. So um, the lens distortion tool, I'm going to go ahead and just bring it over towards pincushion. If I bring it really far, it really messes with that distortion. It looks like we've shot this image with a, um, a, a really a not corrected lens, a Holga or something, um, which purposefully, you know, gives us this distortion. Uh, the chromatic shift, you, it allows you to basically, it creates a chromatic aberration. It shifts the, um, the, the in this case, the red channel uh, and the, the blue channel, and it gives us this kind of interesting color distortion, and it's going to be most apparent towards the edges, right? Really funky stuff. I'm not going to leave that on in this case, because I don't think we need to distort it that much, but um, I'm going to reduce that actually down to zero. And then I'm just going to toggle the lens distortion tool on and off to make sure it's doing what we want it to do. Let's actually take that a little bit further. Looks good. So um, from there, we've got lens distortion. I'm going to turn on dust and scratches or dirt and scratches. And then I actually want to add photo plate and I'm going to get rid of the lens vignette and the film type tool. So um, these are the filters that are built into Analog Effects Pro and you can turn them on by clicking, uh, by scrolling over the filter and then either clicking the plus button to add the filter effect or the minus button to get rid of it. So we're going to go to dirt and scratches. Now, I, I want to show you what happens on, on images 
two different kinds of images with dirt and scratches. Uh, in this case, what dirt and scratches is going to do is kind of add this extra layer again, of kind of shifting reality or of distortion. Um, this is a digital photograph shot with, as you can see, a D850. I've reduced the resolution for demonstration purposes, but um, the, the beauty of, and if you will, the problem I have sometimes with a digital photograph is that they're practically perfect, right? And in this case, I want to kind of scratch it up. I want to add, um, I want to add something to it to, to give the effect of, you know, this has been printed and then rescanned, or basically just to add an extra layer of something. And the thing about the dirt and scratches tool on this image is that this photograph is it's almost entirely in focus from the foreground to the background, and it's almost entirely high frequency. There's textures everywhere. And so by adding the dirt and scratches, it's not really noticeable what it's doing. Although if you turn it on and turn it off, you can definitely see something. What, what we're going to get out of this is this kind of weird shift in textures. And of course, you can control that based upon which of those textures you're actually adding in. So if we go to eroded, you know, and I click on the one with the lines, you're going to see these lines kind of jut through. It's just relatively subtle. Um, or if I click on something that looks like it's a little bit more organic looking, you're going to get little splotches of tones. And this doesn't work on every single photograph, but it does work, um, at least in this photograph, for this purpose, adding this extra little layer of shifting the, the texture and um, the aesthetic of the image. Photoplate's going to do the same kind of thing. So Photoplate is going to add a texture over the top of the photograph, and we can control that using the drop-down menu. Let's go to Concrete. And this is actually muting my contrast quite a bit, which is why I'm adding in my uh, levels and curves. So I'm going to go to levels and curves, turn that on, and I'm just going to go ahead and bump up the midtones a little bit, and then maybe reduce the quarter tones for those shadows. And also my highlights, let's go to basic adjustments for that one. Reduce brightness overall, increase detail extraction just a touch. And actually, let's see what would happen if we increase the saturation. Yeah, bump up that saturation a little bit. So we've we've kind of shifted reality, right? I've I've chosen all of these effects uh, to not to correct the image and not to do a complete overhaul on the photograph, like what we did with the the two images of the buildings. In this case, I kind of just want to mess with the viewer a little bit. I want to draw them in by shifting reality and, and making them actually look at this photo in a, in a different way than, than how they would look if it were just a straight digital image. So I'll distort or bring down the highlights, click the OK button. That's going to bring us back over into Photoshop. And it's just a different way of thinking about using Analog Effects Pro. We're developing our own, um, developing our own grouping. Of, of filters. Now I've just got one more image that I wanted to show and um, in this case it's this nice simple portrait but it's kind of the opposite of the previous image right so here we've got skin tones here we've got a little bit of texture and actually this is a this is was my favorite portrait of the grouping of images that I shot um, of the subject here I'm gonna go into the camera kit as we're talking and um, I know I want basic I'm gonna use the, the bokeh add that and light leaks and lens vignette lens vignette is on so that's good to go and frames so this is a photograph that uh, I kind of messed up when I shot it but it was my favorite of the grouping so uh, I, I recognize that I actually front focused and you can see there's the most texture here her eyes aren't really in focus and you know obviously you're you're always going to get a better result if you've captured the image the way that you want it to be. This one's a mistake, but I want to kind of save the, the, the frame and use it for something. And I think if I were to try to print this gigantic, it would be noticeable that I didn't do a very good job making the capture. But um, I think if I were to make just maybe a small print of this or I was using it online, um, it, it, will be, it will hold up. And then the choices that we make here uh, are going to kind of help the overall feel of the photo. So um, on image control here with the bokeh or bokeh, I'm gonna actually create a little bit more edge out of that by changing the shape. 
Let's create that variation. Um, again, if you increase the uh, the blur strength a lot, it's it, now she actually her face actually looks like it's in focus because relatively to the rest of the image, um, it's you know it's really not. Oh, you know what might be cute or maybe a little kitschy? Eh, we can put hearts in there. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm not going to leave it that way. Let's actually have like a standard lens uh, bokeh or bokeh. Uh, I'm going to reduce that blur a bit more, something like that. And then I'm going to move into my light leaks. So the in this case, the light leaks, I think it's going to be important to use a crisp light leak because aesthetically I'm interested in, in having a light leak on the image, but the photo is already pretty much out of focus, um, you know, throughout. There we go. It creates a little bit of flare. Let's see what happens on this one. Uh, the image is already pretty much out of focus, so I don't... I want to retain a little bit of that sharpness and actually this crisp set to about 50% is going to warm the image just a little bit as well. Let's reduce that 41. Okay. I'm happy with that. Dirt and scratches. Okay. So I don't know if I'm going to actually use dirt and scratches on in this case, but I want to show you what happens. Um, and, and this is one thing that will and can scare folks away from using this filter. It's just, it basically is going to overlay a texture on top of the photograph and now it just looks like we've printed an image and then scratched the heck out of it somehow. Um, any of these is going to kind of create that effect. And on the um, high frequency image, that photo with the um, sort of flooded road that we looked at a minute ago, we can get away with 100% or a negative 100% on the scratches because there's so much texture already in the photograph. Here, if I want to sort of, in my mind, create a successful layer of a little bit of texture, I need to be a little bit, um, a little bit subtler with the uh, the application of the effect. So it's not nearly as noticeable, but we've got a subtle little layer of that scratching effect on there. And then in this case, the lens vignette. Let's see what would happen if we lighten the edge instead of darken the edge. So we're kind of creating a more high key representation by um, lightening, by taking the amount slider towards the right instead of taking it towards the left. Let's do this very subtly. I've shif shifted the uh, shape to be more rectangular. And then I'm just going to add a frame on the image. And in this case, I want the light box or film strip. Let's see, light box. That's the one that I wanted. And I'm just going to add this effect in here. And the thing about all of these uh, frames and then the dirt and scratches and oftentimes the photo plate is it, it can reduce the contrast overall on the image. And so there, there, I say there are two solutions. There's probably a hundred solutions, but there are two kind of simple solutions to that. Um, one is to use the basic adjustments. You can move right into the contrast and, and just start to bump that contrast up. Um, or if you add a levels and curves, you just add like a subtle little S curve to it and you're going to get some of that contrast back a little bit too much on the highlights there. Let's increase the mid tones just a touch. And now we have, you know, this, this modified representation where the original digital image is a little bit flat and um, you can kind of tell that I've, I've front focused. And then with the um, adjusted version, because we're kind of throwing uh, everything except the kitchen sink at it, to to sort of distract the viewer from the technical problems that I've run into when capturing the image. Uh, now we have a, what, what I would say a, a successful looking photograph. Anyways, I hope you found this demonstration to be helpful and maybe uh, you've looked at Analog Effects Pro in a different way. Um, I greatly appreciate you sticking around and uh, watching our demonstration for Analog Effects Pro from the Nick Collection by DXO.